Welcome to Nationwide on the network service of the NTA. We thank you for joining us. I am Lydia ODJ Ochi. Nigeria has expressed formal appreciation to Medicine Sans Frontiers, otherwise referred to as Doctors Without Borders, for their sacrifice in the nation's areas of conflict. President Muhammad Buhari stated this while receiving in audience the international president of the organization, Dr. Christos Christou, on a courtesy visit. State House correspondent Adam Osambu was there. An independent medical humanitarian organization, Doctors Without Borders, have been active in Nigeria since 1996, delivering emergency aid to people affected by armed conflicts, epidemics, natural disasters, and exclusion from health care. President Muhammad Buhari said the sacrifices being made by members as individuals and as a group are quite enormous, especially on non-profit basis. People have uh, come to know, accept and respect you for the sacrifices you are making as individuals and as a, as a group. We remain grateful for the efforts you are making. And I assure you that you will try and secure the environment to allow you to do your job. You know your job is not for materialism, it's a, it's a question of uh, conscience. Commenting on the situation in the Northeast, the president said, despite criticisms, substantial progress has been made by government in discharging its responsibilities. You are one of our, our witnesses that uh, this administration has made some efforts and uh, there have been some successes. In fact, that is the reason why we have this new Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, to make sure that um, uh, resources are properly guided and accounted for, and that uh, NGOs that uh, come to help us can be properly directed and uh, their work will be fully appreciated. President Buhari promised that respite and soccer would come to all the trouble areas, especially now that many prominent and well-to-do organizations are also involved along with international agencies. The international president of Medicines and Frontiers, Dr. Christos Christo, had told the president that Doctors Without Borders works in 10 states across Nigeria and adheres strictly to, amongst others, the principles of independence, impartiality and neutrality. We have delivered many thousands of babies. We have treated people for endemic health issues, for neglected diseases like Noma and for emergency ones like uh, Lassa fever. I have found much to be proud of. It's not about the money, it's not about the numbers. It is about every human being treated and every new life delivered as a cause of hope. Medicine Sam Frontiers has a budget of 17.7 billion naira for its humanitarian services in the year 2020. It has a strength of 3,000, of which 90% Nigerians. From the State House, Adam Musambu. NTA News. And now to politics. INEC will not shift ground on the timelines given in the Edo and Ondo governorship elections holding September and October this year. INEC Chairman Mahmoud Yakubu renewed the stand of the commission at the first quarterly meeting with resident electoral commissioners in Abuja. Mia Ugidi reports. <laughs> 360 degree meeting of electoral umpires, first in the year 2020. So, best wishes for the year we are done in areas. <laughs> then the INEC chairman moves in, no smiles, no handshakes, but bearing a message of warning to both political parties and staff of INEC ahead of Edo and Ondo governorship elections. Political parties need to do more to avoid the conduct of acrimonious primaries 
for failure to observe due diligence in the screening of their candidates. We'll continue to keep an eye on the conduct of our officials and apply appropriate sanctions on airing staff, both regular and ad hoc. The INEC chairman also confirmed the receipt of letter from the Senate president, declaring Bielsa Central and Bielsa West senatorial seats vacant, as Senator Doedere and Senator Lawrence Irujapo assumed position as governor and deputy governor respectively in Bielsa State. Vacancies were declared in two senatorial districts yesterday. We are also awaiting declarations of vacancies for two more senatorial districts. After this, yours and his colleagues were asked to take a leave as deliberations become squarely for family consumption. Mayor Ogedi, NTNews. Meanwhile, the All Progressives Congress APC has returned to the Supreme Court, urging the Apex Court to reverse its decision disqualifying its candidate in the last governorship election in Bielsa State, David Leon. The APC, in an application filed on Thursday by its team of lawyers led by Wole Olanipe Kunsan, with Prince Latif Fagwemi San, also wants the Supreme Court to set aside the wrong interpretation given to its judgment of February the 13th, 2020, and the subsequent execution by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. The party is also contending that the Supreme Court, in its judgment, misinterpreted the November 12th 2019 judgment of the Federal High Court, Abuja. The APC argued that the Supreme Court acted without jurisdiction and denied it fair hearing when it proceeded to disqualify its governorship candidate, even though the Federal High Court in the judgment by Justice Inyang Ekwo, which the Apex Court affirmed, refused the plaintiff's prayer to disqualify Leon. The party also faulted the interpretation given to the Supreme Court judgment by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in deciding to issue certificate of return to the, to the candidates of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. It prayed the Supreme Court to set aside the portion of the judgment where it ordered INEC to declare as winner of as we know of the governorship election, candidates with the highest number of lawful votes and where it ordered INEC to withdraw the certificate of return issued to its governorship candidate and the issuance of fresh one to the candidate who had the highest number of lawful votes. Barely two months after overseeing a successful presidential election in Guinea-Bissau, ECOWAS is having another task at hand to ensure a peaceful electoral process in Togo with long history of political unrest. As Togolese electorate decide who their next president becomes, let's take a look at political issues on ground in Togo. Correspondent Musbao Dan Wahab reports from Lome. It's a few hours to go to the poll in Togo. And the players are in the final hours of preparations. The West African nation is one of the smallest countries on the continent, but then its political crisis is not so minute. Since its 60 years of independence, the Yasimbe's family has ruled for 53 years. The incumbent president, Four Yasimbe, took over in 2005 after the death of his father, Yasimbe Enyadima, who ruled for 38 years. And so, the Iveto periodic political protest took a weekly frequency in 2007. Some were peaceful, and others violence with lives lost. The opposition led protests calling for political reforms, particularly reinstatement of a term limits clause removed from the constitution by late Yasingbe in 2003. Your Excellency Muhammad Buhari. West African Mr. leaders on the platform of ECOWAS mediated and the two term limits restored. But then that does not affect the past 15 year reign of Yasingbe, who is running for a fourth term. If President Four Nyasingbe succeeds in this election against six other candidates, which include former opposition leader John Pear Fab, he has another opportunity in 2025 to contest again. 
from Lome, Togo, Musbal, then we'll have NC News. And back home, President of the Senate Ahmed Lawan met with the Finnish ambassador to Nigeria, Dr. Jaikri Pulkinen, during which Senator Lawan sought the assistance of Finland in deploying technology to fight insurgents. The President of the Senate reiterates that the fight against terrorism demands global collaborations and cooperation. He called on the Finnish government to strengthen its ties with the Nigerian government, especially in the areas of agriculture and commerce, as he requested that the European Union should begin to establish offices across Nigeria so as to help Nigeria set standards for its products. One other important thing that uh, today is an imperative to us is uh, to apply technology to fight uh, the insecurity that we face. As you know, um, Nigeria is battling uh, with so many insecurity. We have uh, the insurgency, banditry, kidnapping, and so many other things, these vices. And the best way to go is to deploy technology uh, even though at the beginning it may be a little bit uh, uh, expensive, but in the long run, uh, it pays off better. The Finnish ambassador informed Senator Lawan that the Finnish Parliament, Parliamentary Committee on Finance will be visiting the National Assembly as part of the country's global interaction. First Lady of Nigeria, Aisha Mohamed Buhari, has advocated for the involvement of all critical stakeholders towards addressing marital challenges and other social problems within the family and the society at large in order to build a strong and prosperous nation. This came to light during the one-day national conference organized by the Future Assured Program of the First Lady, Aisha Buhari, in collaboration with the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs. Sit House correspondent Aliu Kabir reports. The magnitude and recurrence of divorce as well as the incidence of child abuse and its negative consequences on family and the nation at large remain the source of concern by all as part of our advocacy in the quest of shaping the future of the society. The First Lady, in collaboration with the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, organized this national conference with the aim of repositioning the Muslim family for national development. The First Lady, who noted the root causes of these social problems as gradual collapse of the institutions of marriage, expressed optimism that the deliberations of this conference will go a long way in addressing the challenges for the betterment of Nigerian society. Some of the objectives were agreed to pursue, including identifying critical marital challenges and suggesting relevant instruments for addressing them, sensitizing families and other relevant stakeholders on their specific and collective responsibilities towards mitigating marital challenges, and identifying policy matters requiring urgent attention. The conference centered on the need to put all hands on deck to come up with workable solutions of enhancing advocacy and sensitization on the role of family, the traditional rulers, community and political leaders, as well as religious institutions in taking proactive measures to better the future of the Nigerian children and by extension the larger society. We must start solving our problems because nobody from any part of the world will come and solve our own problems for us. If you cannot maintain a wife, don't marry her. If you cannot maintain a child, do not give birth to him. If you cannot maintain a servant, do not employ him. And if you choose to, it is for our governors to make sure there are consequences. We have to support education very, very aggressively. We have to give awareness very, very aggressively. A lot of these recruits of Boko Haram, they probably think they're doing business. It is heartbreaking that we still have not addressed the issue of the child like that. Until that issue is addressed, we are only paying service to the American issue. Speakers at the technical session lend their voices in support towards bringing to bear the role of critical stakeholders, including women as mothers, in mitigating the challenges of marital crises and enhancing family life in general. From the State House, Ali Ukabir, 
NTA News. Every 21st of February is World Mother Tongue Day. We will now go over to Mohammed Rabiu Ali in Kano and let's see how they mark the day there and the people's understanding of the day. Mohammed, if you can hear me clearly, what is the atmosphere like in Kano? Well, thank you, Lydia. Good to see you again. The atmosphere here in Kano is very encouraging uh, due to the fact that uh, mother tongue or mother language day is very, very significant uh, to all of us. And uh, is encouraging in the sense that uh, mothers at home, children speak their mother tongue at home, in schools, and also in neighborhood. So here in Kano, we also commemorate the day, uh, you know, in a good way. And uh, schools, uh, primary and secondary schools, uh, have also, you know, uh, commemorated the day uh, to showcase the importance of uh, 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 language or, or rather mother tongue uh, here in Kano. Hey, Rabbi, aside uh, uh, marking the day, how well are schools taking the responsibility of ensuring that children take the mother tongue seriously? Well, in this case, uh, schools from primary to post-primary levels, uh, there is compulsory for them to take a uh, Hausa language uh, and also Igbo and Yoruba as well uh, in uh, schools. So uh, it's very encouraging and uh, the schools management uh, took it upon themselves to ensure that uh, mother tongue you know, is given priority uh, from the primary one up to uh, the secondary school level. So they are doing, uh, uh, you know, well uh, and they are committed uh, in this direction. Thank you for that uh, insight. Now, tell us, what do you think, in, 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 your own, in your own understanding, do you think that uh, students would understand uh, subjects better when taught in the native language? I think so, uh, 100%. And uh, you see, when I give an example of China, India, and other countries, you know, they use their own mother tongue in schools. So for we Nigerians, if we are going to use our mother tongue uh, in our schools, uh, students uh, can be able to, you know, express themselves, can be able to know, you know, the subjects uh, uh, all fully well. And uh, I, I, I can tell you that uh, presently, Bayero University Kano has taken the, 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 the bull uh, by the horn, you know, uh, in introducing uh, biology, chemistry, physics in house language. So, uh, if really this uh, uh, come to stay, uh, students can be able to you know know these subjects better than uh, the way uh, uh, they are teaching them presently, you know, in English. So, bringing it uh, down or to domesticate it, it will really help, you know, in assisting students uh, to acquire knowledge, you know, with ease. Interesting, Rabiu. Now, tell us what other language. Can you speak personally, aside your mother tongue? Yeah, I, I, I can speak Igbo language. I don't know if you, you know, we can interact with you in Igbo. Or maybe I can send a message uh, over there for people to know that, yes, I can speak Igbo. If you can, then we interact. If you cannot, then I will send a message to people over there. Okay, go ahead. Say something in Igbo language. Yes. Uh, the message here, yeah, you said? <laughs> in Igbo language, go ahead. Say something. Okay. Uh, Asham Kangunu, that Biko Kunu, Marana, that Unu, Nemadu, Nanea, Bo, Ye, I, I, Cho, Kaine, Me. Thank you very much, Rabbi. I'm really impressed. Thank you so, so much. 
<laughs> Thank you so All much. Right. That was All Rabi right. speaking the Igbo language from Kano. Today, and like I said earlier, is the International Day of the Mother Tongue, celebrated every 21st of February globally. Against this background, Ruth Aguela paid a visit to one of the schools in the Federal Capital Territory to find out how familiar the children are with their mother tongue. Take a look. This is the International Day of Mother Tongue. It is set aside to promote multilingualism and also to preserve global heritage. Now for us as a nation, how well have we preserved heritage talking about our native languages? Because it is believed that languages are the most powerful instruments used in preserving and developing our tangible and intangible heritage. Now, many experts fear that some of these languages may go extinct if not well preserved because only a few have genuinely been given a place in the education system. Now we're here in one of the schools here in the FCT to find out how many of these Nigerian languages have been taught in the school and how well these children know this language. In Hausa, Biri is a monkey. In Hausa, Gongombiri is a gorilla and some other animals like that. But where are you from? I'm from Kadunama. Can you speak your own native language? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, Jin Shunji. Yeah, Van. What did you just say? Yeah, Jin Shunji. I know. What did you say in English? Translate. Good evening. Good morning, Ibo is Ibolacho or Tsutuoma. In um, good afternoon, Ndeoma. Good morning, Ikara is Seksa Saku. How old are you? I'm nine. You're nine. So in what language do your parents communicate with you at all? They, they communicate with Igala. Igala, you understand but you can speak it fluently. I, I understand but I cannot speak it friendly. A lot of people have said the role of the parents is very strong if we must preserve this heritage, if not where we're headed as a nation. You know, in the school, we only speak English. But at home, you need to let your child know where he or she comes from and be familiar with the native, with the culture. As a country, as a nation, we should put this in our school's curriculum. Let school have Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba in the curriculum so that we be able to teach these children and at home parents too be able to teach them where the teachers stop at school. In Batawa, Sata Nigeria, Danduka Kafina, don't have in Kamsa, Danasaranta, Alay Temekemu. Bravo, thank you very much. And yes, as we celebrate the International Mother Tongue Day, let us remember to lay the foundation right for this future generation. In Abuja, Ruth Aguela, NTA News. Many thanks, Ruth. That was a good one. We now join Chinenye Mwoni live in Enugu on fillers on how the day has been celebrated in that area of the country. Chinenye, if you can hear me. What is the celebration of the Mother Tongue Day like in Enugu? Okay, good afternoon to you. Here in Enugu, most people are aware that today is International Mother Tongue Day, even though there were no organized events to celebrate the day. But the theme of this year's celebration, which is language without barriers, is a call to ensure that there are no barriers to the use of indigenous languages. How well are non-indigenous communicating in Igbo? Okay, you know people trained in indigenous languages and they translate other languages from their mother tongue. Research has also shown that those who are trained in their mother tongues have a mastery of other indigenous languages. I have with me here some northerners that are resident in Enugu. Even though Hausa is their indigenous language, they also speak Igbo as if it is their indigenous language. With me here is Belo Bashiru. He is from Sokoto State, but he speaks Igbo so fluently as if he is an Igbo man. Hello, Bashiru. Assalamu alaikum. Sunana Belo Bashiru Isa. Like a Sokoto State. My name is Bello Bashir Isa. I'm from Sokoto State. 
a femme pour belle sur le sable, moi je suis côté street. Mais elle va quand bis. Et elle ne va quand même pas. Elle va quand même sur quoi ou elle va quand même business. Ana aya amu ma eba. So ma bu wan for by rights. Proudly wan for by rights. So ndi boku enu. Ndi boku enu. Ndi boku enu. Ndi boku zo enu. Yeah. My name is Bello Bashirisa and I'm indigenous of Sokoto State. And I reside here. I was born and brought up here. I do my business here. I went to my primary and secondary school here in Enugu. And I've been living here with my family in peace. And I like it here because I was born and brought up here. And I love this environment. I can't live here. Here is my home forever. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Issa Salis Mohammed is also from Sokoto State. And he also speaks Igbo so fluently as if he's an Igbo man. Yeah. Issa, tell us something in Igbo. My name is Issa Salis Mohammed. I was born here and grew up in Enugu State. So I come from I come from Sokoto State. I come from Sokoto State. I was born here and grew up here. And normally all my friends, friends mumwere eba anua. Hakare kwanke my own language, Ibo. What I go? So mwa buzo ya usa amuru mu noboda na asuku Ibo. Na asuko Ibo obele obele. Muna my brother. Where are na afa eba kitabu my brother. My senior brother, you are being told more direct. So I work with one of my friend again. He has something to say. That is. So you heard them speak Igbo as if it's their indigenous language. It's back to you in the studio. I'm not done with you yet. I was actually going to ask you beyond preservation of the mother tongue. Do you see it as a medium to foster national unity and cohesion? But that interview has answered that question. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Yes, I can see the Igbo men, uh, Hausa men, speaking Igbo language. What other language can you speak? Igbo language, yes. Okay, for me, I am Igbo. I can speak a little of Hausa. I can say a few things in Hausa language. Things like saying, if I want to say, how is today, I will say, ya ya yo. If I want to say, inawuni, inawuni means good evening. I can also say it in Igbo. And I, also, I can also greet Nigerians by saying, inawuni and Nigeria. If you ask me my name, me sunanki, I will say sunana chinayemwe. That means my name is chinayemwe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chinenye. Very interesting, interesting there. Thank you. Let's now still join Lanre Ido in Ibadan for their contributions as the world commemorates Mother Tongue Day. Thank you, Lydia. The initiative to promote the preservation and protection of all languages brought about the setting aside of a day for mother language. In this report, Ken Dig Barry takes a look at the mother language in southwestern part of Nigeria and how the people are ensuring their language does not go into extinction. First, children speak Nigerian's indigenous languages, namely Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa fluently and confidently. The narration has, however, changed, whereby children can barely communicate in their mother tongue without English interjection. Some are of the opinion that many of the languages are facing extinction, while some believe languages are still intact. Mother tongue, our own language, language of our own state or country or different dialects. How many Yoruba? From Oyo. Now, I do train my, all my children in dialects. I love them to understand my dialects than foreign language. When my children is, will come back from school, I always make sure that I speak in Yoruba with them so that gradually they will be picking it up. It's a shameful thing for our children, for younger generation, not able to understand or speak it. Because as we speak, the foreigners are learning it. Ekaro, Ekaso, Odabo, I can speak. Yoruba is my mother language now, and I understand Yoruba very well. And I also understand another mother language like Aousa. Nakwana is, is a greeting like good morning. Educationists advocate that children be taught in Yoruba language in schools, saying it will enhance better knowledge and understanding of the foreign language. Even in the House of Assembly, it is even being encouraged that when they were making laws, 
they can even be making it in Yoruba so that people will understand. It is deduced that when children are taught in the local dialect, it will help widen their scope in Ibadan. Omokende Ibari, NTA News. With me in the studio is the head of Department Linguistics and African Languages, University of Ibadan, Professor Duro Adeliki. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, my first question to you is, what is your take on the alarming statistics on the extinction of indigenous languages? Worrisome, because we are not proud of our African languages, we believe Unless we are able to use foreign languages, we are rustic, illiterate, but this is wrong assumption. You can think and still discuss in your language. And uh, this is the reason why we are worried that even uh, the policy on language, national policy on the language for the school system is not being adhered to by the agencies who are supposed to implement as uh, instructed. Uh, so, the three major languages in Nigeria, Hausa, Ibu, Yoruba are not taught in some schools up to now. And at the end of the day, uh, I'm talking as a Waek or Neko. They are taking as an optional subjects. Why languages like English and uh, French are made compulsory? And so that's the reason why we are worried. And uh, when we talk about languages in Nigeria, we talk about over 530 well over being spoken across the length and breadth of Nigeria. But you know, if you go to Edo or Delta, within the local government you can find not dialects, four or five languages. Mm -hmm. Same thing along play two. So the issue now is the some are regarded as minority. Why some are regarded as a Majority. Uh, majority because of the <clears throat> number of population okay. involved. I mean the speakers. Mm. And uh, so one is uh, worried okay. because not all the languages in Nigeria have been reduced to writing. That is, they don't have alphabets. Okay. Not to talk of photography. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there hope? for survival of indigenous languages in an heterogeneous country like ours? Is there any what? Uh, is there any hope of survival of indigenous languages in an heterogeneous country like ours? <laughs> you know why I ask that question? Because uh, one thing is this. It depends on the number of speakers. For instance, in Yoruba, it's a cross-border language. In the sense that when you leave Nigeria, you still get speakers of Yoruba in the Republic of Benin. Okay. When you move further Togo. You still, uh, to Togo, yes. you still get some. And when you talk about Hausa or Fufude, okay. you get them across, something like that. Upper, uh, uh, yeah. uh, outside Nigeria. Yes. And so we do have some languages, even in the south, south, which are cross-border languages. And within Nigeria, you talk of Kwara State, you talk of uh, Kogi, Yoruba, you still find them spread across. Mm -hmm. Same thing, Yoruba, spreading to Edo, okay. spreading to Delta. However, not every state is developing Yoruba okay. as, should, as it should be developed. Okay. okay. Now, lastly, um, what is the role of stakeholders such as traditional, traditional institutions, parents and teachers? The parents should tell folk tales 
to their children, the others should use indigenous languages in their domain, and they should ensure that they encourage all their subjects to use uh, their local languages as official language when anything is being conducted within that domain. Thank you very much, sir. I've been speaking with Professor Duro Adelike of the Department of Linguistics and African Languages, University of Ibadan. Rest of Nationwide continues after this break. Stay with us. Like making a step while the world is going forward and the school is making a step backward. The students, they are sit on the floor, no chair for them, even the classroom is nothing to write home about. We have only one toilet and that toilet is not good. Going to that toilet is an ISO, 980 people using one toilet. New digital technologies have thrown up new opportunities for online news gathering, reporting and management. NTA TV College invites online reporters, journalists, public relations practitioners, multimedia producers and freelance reporters to a special two-week intensive course on intermediate online news reporting skills. Take advantage of the course to upscale your skills in computer-assisted reporting, social media content production strategies, online media platforms for information dissemination and management. Date 2nd to 13th March 2020. Course fee 80,000 Naira per participant. Accommodation inclusive. Also running is a special four-week intensive course on modern trends in broadcast media marketing. It is an essential course for the sales force in the broadcast media, in the public and private sector, to sharpen their skills and improve their capacities to deal with contemporary marketing challenges and competitors. Date 16th March to 9th April 2020. Course fee 100,000 Naira only per participant. Accommodation inclusive. The venue for both courses is the serene and secure environment of NTA TV College near Old Government House, Rayfield, Jaws. For more inquiries, please call 0803-314-4383 or 0806-980-9807. NTA TV College, Jaws, training you to be the best you want to be. Are you looking for a serene environment where you can relax and feel at home with family and friends? Then search no more because Liverpool VIP Hotel and Unique Resort is the answer. At Liverpool VIP Hotel and Unique Resort, we have well furnished standard rooms and suites, 24 hours power supply, advanced security with CCTV cameras everywhere, VIP and bush bar, restaurant with all kinds of African and continental cuisines, assorted drinks, charmer sports, modern 80 seater conference room. And now, check this out 30% discount for all rooms and suites for three months. Hurry now to Liverpool VIP Hotels and Unique Resort, located at number. Number 4 St. Michael's Crescent of Tombia Extension, Jerry A. Phase 3, Port Island, River State. For reservation and more information, call 080-67-64-0587, Liverpool VIP Hotel and Unique Resort, True Hospitality. <laughs> travel to London for the second week in a row as they take on Crystal Palace in the league. Will they achieve the double over their host this season or will Crystal Palace carry out their revenge? Find out as Crystal Palace hosts Newcastle United on the Premier League Live on NTA Network at 3.30pm this Saturday. The Premier League Live is brought to you by Coca-Cola and Axis Bank. Thanks for staying. It's time to join Ruth in Lagos for more reports on Nationwide. It's over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Lydia, and welcome to Lagos. Or do I say Lydia Eshon Ekabo Sieku?
The Lagos State Governor, Babajide Sonwolu, is advocating the introduction of a robust legislation that would help Nigeria reap the benefits derivable from digital revolution. The governor stated this in a message to the Senate Committee on ICT and Cybercrimes during its visit to the government house, Lagos. Thomas Ogbetere reports. Of the Senate Committee on ICT and Cybercrime, led by the Chairman Senator Yakubu Oseni, expressed concern about the threat of cybercrime, especially with the current position of Nigeria as one of the countries with a high rate of cybercrime. Senator Yakubu Oseni urged the Lagos State Government to embrace the use of technology and also encourage Lagos residents to participate in the Senate Plant Training Program for Lagos Indigenous. The advancement of ICT has accelerated the pace of globalization and has completely impacted on life and work. It is the pivot for transformation of economies today. The Lagos State Deputy Governor Dr. Bafemi Anzar said a robust and appropriate legislation would enable ICT firms to set up international data center in Nigeria, thereby attracting immense benefits of creating jobs for the youths. Lagos State, we understand the need for ICT. So you realize that we are the first state in Nigeria to have a, de a, a dedicated ministry on science and technology. So there are other states that have education, science, technology. But we realize that that clouds the whole thing. Dr. Hamzad also urged the Senate to prevail on the Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, to develop telecoms infrastructure in rural areas. In Lagos, Thomas Ogbetari, NTA News. And to the environment, the global warning that the amount of plastic in the oceans will outweigh fishes by 2050 is real, and concerted efforts must be intensified towards tackling marine litter and plastic waste. Minister of State for Environment, Sharon Ikwazu, at the presentation of an action plan geared towards this direction, said the federal government is taking steps to end the dumping of 200,000 tons of plastics into the country's waters annually. Michael Olale reports. Nigeria is among 20 nations that contributes 83% of total volume of land-based plastic waste globally, with an estimated 32 million tons of solid waste generated annually, according to the United Nations Environment Program. The overall implication is that $13 billion is lost to damage caused to the marine ecosystem by plastics. Changing this trend is the focus of this gathering, which is conversing for improved awareness and enforcing existing laws. Ministry of Environment already has a policy on waste management. The issue of single-use plastic is something that has come up as well, and we are working with stakeholders as well. Some people are making money knowing fully well that their product is contributing to the pollutions that we are all, uh, we are all having whether they're going to set up a fund that will be responsible for cleaning up all this mess that we're experiencing, they have to be part and parcel of this cleanup exercise that we're experiencing. For all key players, signatory to the Marine Litter Action Plan, the task before them is to intensify monitoring and propound research methodology for total eradication of plastic pollution. We've engaged a number of marine litter marshals across coastal communities and the total areas as pilot scheme. They are already first responders in our quest to tackle the challenge or menace of marine litter. The conceptualization of the plan was started in 2016 with the identification of marine litter and plastic pollution hotspots is expected to encourage environmental protection solutions to strengthen Nigerian's commitment to sustainable development goals. In Lagos, Michael Olale, NT News. And that's our contribution from Lagos. Lydia, it's back to you. Eshego Oremi, back in Abuja. Community poli policing, decentralization of the police force, as well as synergy among security agencies have been highlighted as some of the necessary steps towards addressing Nigeria's internal security challenges. These and many more solutions were tabled by guests on Good Morning Nigeria while discussing the need for community policing in Nigeria. 
Alika Okpanachi Arua reports. The increasing rate of insecurity in Nigeria has become worrisome not only to the citizens but the government as well. To tackle the situation and safeguard lives and properties, get some good morning Nigerian says grassroots policing is the way to go. They however emphasized on effective collaboration and synergy between the federal and the state government security agencies in terms of intelligence gathering and information sharing. Uh, it's uh, a strategy whereby God-fearing, well-mannered and good-charactered uh, members of a locality are expected to partner proactively with the regular police to secure the environment. Police need to take responsibility for internal security. There is no running away from this. And um, our governors, uh, the level of National Security Council, need, need to drive that. On the issue of Amotecon security network in the southwest, the governor of Ondo State maintained that due to the high density of forest and the rising tide of insecurity at the grassroots, there is need for more proactive measures to be taken. We are talking about crime that has become local somehow. And we need people who know the terrain to assist. And we believe that, look, just as a state governor, I mean, I stay in Akure, how, how many places do I, can I see at the same time? All the governors must come together. Let us come together and see what we are going to do if we really want to help ourselves. Rather than operating different kind of policing and at the end of, end of the day we see ourselves getting in conflict with, uh, with one another. The guests, however, appeal to critical stakeholders and security agencies to work hand in hand with the state for the effective implementation of community policing in Abuja, Alika, Opanachi, Arua, and Tienus. It is a general belief that empowering the youths educationally is the most effective way of making them an asset and veritable tool in nation building. In this regard, the people of Dambata in Kano State have devised a way of stimulating competition among youths in academic pursuit. Abdullahi Mustafa, during a visit to a recent visit to the area, witnessed the celebration of more locals who joined the League of Professors. For generations, Dambata is known as one of the most educationally developed communities in northern Nigeria. The community, which embraced formal education more than 90 years ago, now boasts of many technocrats, heads of public and private organizations, as well as dozens of professors. Uh, we don't have the presence of many tertiary institutions in Dambata, but despite this, the people of Dambata are resilient to go to any part of the world in order to further their education. Recently, Dambata community leaders organized a grand reception in honor of eight more resilient scholars who joined the League of Professors. When we were trying to peel our forms for admission into the university, people are trying to say you should peel engineering, medicine, I said no. I will just apply for mathematics. It's an education of the investment the community has made in education. The event was not only to celebrate the eight new professors and a head of federal tertiary institution, but to also encourage the younger ones. I feel very proud, therefore nine times proud. And we have to see more, you know, of such uh, professors from this, lo this local government. Because if you educate, you provide healthcare services, you provide employment, certainly you are going to have a very peaceful community that will champion the growth of the economy of our dear state, particularly this our local government, uh, Lambata. Encouraging the youth to acquire quality education, they believe, is an alternative solution to societal ills. From Lambata in Kano State, Abdullah Mustafa, NTA News. We now go on a live broadcast, a convocation lecture going on right now in Jigawa. Please enjoy that.
Hello, good evening viewers and welcome to a live broadcast of the fifth pre-convocation lecture of the Federal University Dusi, Chigawa State. It's been televised from your favorite uh, television station, the NTA, Africa's largest television network. We are reaching you live from the convocation arena here in Dusi, Chigawa State. Interestingly, the Vice President of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, who is also a senior advocate of Nigeria, is a lecturer at this pre-convocation lecture. And the topic is facing the new decade. Prominent personalities are already seated, including the host governor, Muhammad Badaru Abubakar of Chigawa State, our royal fathers, been led by Sultan Muhammad Saad Abubakar, the Royal Highnesses, the Emir of Kanu, Alaji Muhammad Sanusi II, and the host Emir of Dusi, Dr. Nuhu Muhammad Sanusi. Thank you very much. May I invite the Chief Imam of Federal University, Duse, Ustaz Adam Tefida, to give us an opening prayer. Salut ala Nabi al Karim. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا أذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا الله أسب the prayer it is my honor and privilege to most sincerely welcome our distinguished invited guest to the fifth like, like I earlier told you, you are, we are reaching you live from the Federal University Duse, and the event is a pre-convocation lecture of the Federal University Duse ahead of the convocation which is coming up tomorrow. The current Vice Chancellor is Professor Fatima Batulu Mukhtar. 
Let me take you to, into the history of this university before the commencement of the lecture proper. Federal University Duse was established along with eight others. It started its academic activities and session in 2011-2012 session. It started with three faculties, which are subsequently increased to six faculties, and currently the university is proud of 32 departments. Uh, this is an indication of uh, a lot of achievements recorded uh, under the leadership of the two university vice chancellors, of the university's vice chancellor, Professor J.D. Amin and Professor Fatima Batulu Mukhtar. Currently, there is an effort to establish two new faculties of medicine and health sciences. A school of postgraduate studies is already in place. The students' population increased from 202 in 2012, which is currently 9,491. Before the establishment of this federal university in Duse, uh, people from these catchment areas uh, of Jigawa, Bauchi, uh, and Kanu areas in the northwestern part of Kanu depend largely on Viro University Kanu for their to further their studies uh, in that university. Our the establishment, this is the fifth convocation. It has passed out a lot of graduates involved uh, undergraduate level and postgraduate level. I told you uh, attending this pre-convocation lecture and the lecturer is Professor Yemi Oshimbaju, the Vice President of Nigeria. The topic is facing the new decade. Like you are aware, new decade, we are in a new decade, 2020, uh, which is ushering a lot of things in the social economic development of our nation. So we we'll wait and hear from the Vice President himself and also uh, the Chairman of the occasion, is the Waziri of Duse, Alaji Bashir al -Hatu. Alaji Bashir al -Hatu served as minister in two different ministries of interior, mines and seed development and also was the board chairman of ventures uh, in the country. So then you see Professor Abubakar Ademur Rashid, MFR, you are welcome sir. May I recognize the former governor, deputy governor of Kano State, Professor Hafiz Abubakar, who is seated close to the NUC secretary. You are highly welcome, sir. May I recognize the pro chancellor, the immediate past pro chancellor and chairman, governing council, Federal University, Duse Al Haji Ibrahim Akuyam. You are welcome, sir. I also like to recognize the Secretary of the State Government of Jigawa State, Al Haji Abubakar Fainini. You are welcome, sir. May I recognize the May I recognize the Director General of UBEC, Professor Hamid Boboi, ES of UBEC, please. May I recognize Our Lady of excellence the first woman to be appointed vice chancellor in the northwest geopolitical zone the first vice chancellor to my knowledge to get NUC approval to mount 37 programs in the university the first vice chancellor among the 12 newly established universities to bring in the vice president to honor the convocation ceremony. She is the founder of the Faculty of Management Sciences, founder of the Faculty of Computing, founder of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences, and inshallah, the founder of the Faculty of Education. She's a role model to women in Nigeria, the second substantive vice chancellor of Federal University, you say, Professor Fatima Batul Mukhtar. 
May I quickly recognize the present because they say beside every successful woman, there is a man. I'd like to recognize the husband of the Vice Chancellor, Barista Muzamil Hanga, who is humbly present here with us. Thank you, sir. May I recognize the Registrar of the University, Malam Bukar Usman, FCIA, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Services, Professor Abdul Karim Sabo Muhammad, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Administration, Professor Usman Adamizge, the Bursar of the University, Malam uh, Abdul Gimba, and the University Registrar, Professor Gaji Badawi. We also have the representative of DG of NIMET, Elijah Bakar Siddiq. You are all highly welcome. Time will not permit me to finish all the recognition. It is now my honor and privilege to invite our Lady of Substance, Elegance, and Excellence, the Vice Chancellor of Federal University, Duse, Professor Fatima Batul Mukhtar, to come forward to deliver her speech. Thank you has been invited to deliver her speech, Professor Fatima Batulu Mokhtar. Under her watch, about 37 faculties have been established, uh, 37 courses have been approved by the National Universities Commission and the Federal University Dusi. Professor Ma. GCON, the governor of Jigawa State, and his deputy, his eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, His Royal Highness, the Emir of Kano, His Royal Highness, the Emir of Duse, the chairman of this occasion, al Haji Bashir Al-Hatu, chairman, sir, the MC, I think, has recognized many eminent personalities in this gathering and uh, I would like to please acknowledge all of them and even the others that have not been acknowledged because of time factor. Chairman, sir. Yes. Because we are here to listen to the vice president and we have selected one hour for him and I'm sure once he starts talking, nobody will want him to end abruptly. So with this, Distinguished personalities and invitees, good afternoon. Today marks another milestone in the history of our university. I feel very strongly elated and more so when I look at the caliber of distinguished personalities that are here. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making it possible for us to witness such a historic occasion, the fifth convocation lecture of Federal University Duse. I must thank all our distinguished guests for making it here. May Allah in his infinite mercy reward you abundantly. And to the convocation lecturer, Professor Yemi Osimbanjo, CON, Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, I must admit that when you indicated your agreement to come and deliver the convocation lecture, It was one of my most exciting moments as the Vice Chancellor of this university. You made me and all members of the FUD family really proud. So many people, including colleagues, ask me, how did you do it? And I tell them it's my secret. Sir, I thank you most profoundly for accepting to present the lecture titled Facing the New Decade. You can see that the people of Jigawa State are really happy to see you here, sir. I became even more excited when I recall your eloquence, exceptional speeches, and presentations in different places. You are indeed one credible Nigerian whose words are always peddled by the media at home and abroad in view of their cogent contents. So on behalf of Federal University Dusa family, I would say you are heartily welcome. Considering your enviable and huge status as Nigeria's number two citizen, the Vice President, your enormous experience, sir, you are irrefutably more eminently qualified than anybody to present this lecture. And we wish you, we wish to pray that God Almighty continue to increase you in wisdom and good health. Amen. 
With every sense of modesty and humility, I wish to thank my big brother, Alhaji Bashir Al Hatu, the Wazir in Duse, for accepting to chair this all important lecture. Coincidentally, Alhaji Bashir Al Hatu is also a distinguished and a prominent lawyer, a businessman, and a former politician, as he often says. Born in Duse, Jigawa State, 12th of November 1949, he attended Duse Junior Primary School. 1956 to 1959, Sumaila Senior Primary School, 1960 to 1962, Kano Government Secondary School, now Rufa College, 1963 to 1967, and did his A-levels at Abdullah Bayro College, now Bayro University, Kano, 1968 to 1969. He later graduated from Ahmad Bele University in 1972 with LLB Honors Degree, and was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1973. He attended a number of administrative and legal courses. After a seven year sojourn in the Kano State Civil Service, where he worked as Assistant Secretary in both the Ministry of Works and Survey and Ministry of Agriculture, from where he moved to the Ministry of Justice as State Council. Al Haji Bashir Al Hatu was transferred to the Water Resources and Engineering Construction Agency, RECA, where he served as secretary and legal advisor. In 1978, he won an election to the Constituent Assembly that fashioned out the 1979 Constitution representing Duse Jahun constituency in the now Jigawa state. At the conclusion of the Assembly, he became one of the founding members of the National Party of Nigeria, NPN, where from 1979 to 1983, he was variously Kano State Assistant Secretary, State Secretary, and later Assistant National Legal Advisor. He was also the pioneer National Secretary of the Defunct Action Congress in 1987. He also served in the Constitution Review Committee and later member of the Constituent Assembly that produced the 1989 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He also served as the chairman of the Committee on the Federal Capital Territory during that assignment. Similarly, Alhaji Dalhatu served as member of the 2014 National Conference. He at different times was member of the Board of Directors of the Nigerian Ports Authority in Lagos, chairman Nigerian Agricultural and Cooperative Bank member governing board institute of advanced legal studies member judicial service committee kano and jigawa state chairman jigawa state economic management and investment promotion advisory council chairman highland waters nigeria limited and chairman jigawa holdings limited amongst others your excellency sir very soon it is it is our hope that alhaji bashir alhatu will be a major shareholder in the Federal University do say microfinance. Chairman Sir, we are coming to see you after this event. His impeccable credentials again saw him clinching the post of a minister of the Federal Republic four times under three consecutive heads of state, namely Chief Ernest Shonikan, General Sani Abacha, and General Abdusalami Abubakar as minister. He held the positions of Secretary for Transport and Aviation, Minister of Power and Steel, and Minister of Internal Affairs. Some of his, of his present engagements include Principal Partner BM Alhatu and Co, Legal Practitioners, Chairman and Life Member of the Body of Benches, Member and Waziri Duse Emirate Council, Chairman New Nigerian Development Company NNDC Kaduna, Honorary Consul Republic of Tunisia, Chairman Sickle Cell Awareness Initiative, Chairman Kati Nigeria Limited, member of the Board of Trustees of Proposed Enterprise University, Unity, uh, Uni uh, University Kano, Executive Director of Freedom Radio Group, Chairman Isawali Empowerment Initiative, member Nigerian Bar Association, member International Bar Association, member Board of Trustees, Rufa College, Kano Old Boys Association. Chairman, Northern Nigeria Commodity Marketing Company, member Jigawa State Investment and Property Limited. Alhaji Alhatu holds the traditional title of Wazir Induse. 
He's a well-traveled Nigerian, having set his foot on almost all the continents of the surface of the earth. He's happily married and blessed with children. He's, a key among his hobbies includes reading, traveling, and golf. With all these attainments, permit me to describe this accomplished lawyer as a positive symbol of patriotism and dedication to the service of, of humanity, and therefore a great Nigerian that is worthy of emulation. Your Excellency, sir, distinguished guest, al Haji Bashir al Hatu has trained so many lawyers, and uh, my actually my husband is one of them. So uh, he, he, he benefited from his magnanimity. Mr. Chairman, sir, I wish to seize this opportunity to introduce you to this highly esteemed gathering and also thank you most profoundly for kindly responding to our invitation and for agreeing to serve as the chairman of the occasion. We sincerely feel greatly honored and on behalf of Federal University Duse, I wish to hugely thank you and welcome you to Federal University Duse. Sir, I believe you have all it takes to effectively handle the assignment. And with this, I would like to declare this convocation lecture open. Thank you and welcome once again. Thank you very much, Ma. Shall we give the Vice Chancellor another round of applause, please? The Vice Chancellor, Federal University Dusi, Professor Fatima Batulu Mokhtar, uh, gave the welcome address and also a brief bio data of the chairman of this occasion, a legal numerary, Al Haji Bashir Al Hatu, also the holder of the title of Waziri of Dusi. Like I told you earlier on, Al Haji Bashir Al Hatu was a minister in the Federal Ministry of Mines and Steel, and also a minister in the Federal Ministry of Interior. And you are also chairman of the Board of Ventures uh, in charge of issues of legal uh, bench of legal bench liminaries. Uh, recently, he finishes that position. Right now, he has started uh, delivering his. Muhammad Badr Abu Bakar, Your Excellency, the Deputy Governor of Jigawa, and the Excellency, former Deputy Governor of Kano. Professor A. Abdul Rashid of NUC, Your Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, Your Highness, the Emir of Kano, Your Highness, the Emir of Duse, Members of the National Assembly, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I feel absolutely humbled by being asked to chair such an august occasion in which the vice president himself will be here. It's not the first time for me in the last 12 months I have chaired, I am chairing the second occasion during which the vice president will be available. The first time was in March, where the legal profession, under the distinguished leadership of the body of benches, honored him with the plaque of distinguished career and service. I am also chairing this occasion. I hope. I am not going to get used to it, um, but it is a very thrilling feeling. I am even more humbled in the fact that together with the Vice President, the Governor of Kano, the Deputy Governor, His Eminence the Sultan, the Emir of Kano and the Emir of Duse, and I am presiding over this. I must wake up after this ceremony because this must be a dream for me. Your Excellency, your presence here is one more example 
of your dedication to duty, your absolute commitment to the goodness of Nigeria, your entire effort to make sure that life is better for the Nigerians, particularly the downtrodden, the weak, the poor, and the disabled. Women and students, Your Excellency, your efforts have not gone unnoticed by Nigerians. We only pray for you to give you more, more energy, further strength to continue doing the very, very good work we have been doing. You have been tireless in your effort to serve Nigeria and humanity. I understand you are just coming from Akure and you are going to go to Lagos tonight and tomorrow you are heading to Benin Oz. Well, I am glad I am over 70 now. I have to just admire this effort, but we are grateful. Nigerians are indebted to you, sir, because you symbolize honesty and integrity, and we are, we are the better for it. Your presence here also gave me some unsettling moments. Last night, I called my friend Ayoruba man in Lagos. I said, look, Kule, the vice president is going to come to do this tomorrow, and I have to mention his name publicly. As a house of Fulani man, I have been calling him Osim Banjo. Is this the correct way to say it? Because so many people call him in various moments. He said, listen, that S is not S like in Hausa language. That S is S in Yoruba, and it has a dot, I think, on top of, at the bottom. And it should be shh. So it is Oshim Banjo. So I'll be repeating this, this name over and over again, just in case I make a mistake this afternoon. I hope I have said it correctly this afternoon, sir. All right. I must also appreciate and recognize the presence of the governor of Jigawa State, His Excellency Muhammad Badr Abu Bakr, and also appreciate and express gratitude for his continuous support to this university. I am sure there will be a lot of time when his support will be expressed publicly. Although I'm not in the university community, I would not want to embarrass him. But let me say this as, a, as an indigenous of Jigawa State. Badara Ubakar had been very, very meticulous in his administration. He has been dogged in the spread of good, goodies to all our people, to all nooks and crannies. And I thank you, sir, very much for continuing to do so for the benefit of our people. You have introduced and sustained accountability. And it is now very common knowledge in Jigao State that accountability has set in and there is transparency absolutely. Most of us here have our telephones in our pocket. But I trust there is someone here in whose pocket is a calculator. That is how much, how meticulous, how careful, and how considerate he has been handling and dealing with the finances of our state. We thank you very much, sir, for that. There are two well-known Babas in Nigeria, Baba Buhari and Baba Me Calculator. And this has gone into the psyche of our people. And honestly, it is good 
because this has set in and people now have expectation of good governance. Thank you, Your Excellency. I must appreciate the Vice Chancellor for this invitation and for seeing me fit to actually chair the pre-convocation lecture this afternoon. She was not bribing me because I tutored her husband in the practice of law. Although we share a very close family relationship. The Vice Chancellor had systematically expanded this university. She had been very, very effective in introducing knowledge and character to our children. She has propelled the the status of this university far ahead of those universities created with the university, Federal University Duse. Vice Chancellor, we are grateful and indebted to you. I must not forget, of course, that her efforts have been supportive, supported by a very, very loyal and supportive husband who is always by her side and does her bidding whether she says it or not. In this part of the country, Your Excellency, people like that are very much admired. And I do not call the Vice Chancellor Professor, although of course we all know she is. I call her Hajia because her husband, in normal circumstances of our own living in northern Nigeria, a person who goes after his wife all the time, trying to please her without even she mentioning, is called Mujin Hajia. And he is a clear example of Mujin Hajia. No, but you see, you see, sir. Although I believe the vice president is also one of these people, I think uh, in, the, in the way we do it, when you please your wife, it's a very, very honorable and distinguished uh, thing to do. But for Mujin Hajia, he knows what I, I, I mean. Let me also say that uh, today's, today's lecture is looking at the, uh, the next 10 years. Mr. Vice President, you have made sure that the next 10 years of this country has, has been firmly, firmly rooted in good governance, in, 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 in exemplary determination to help the, man, uh, the poor man in Nigeria. You have walked the street of this country. You have been to our villages and markets. You have upgraded students and women. You have dealt with so many other social uh, uh, investment programs that Nigeria will remain forever grateful to you. We thank you very much, sir. This university will continue to grow in the name and the blessing of Allah, inshallah. I thank you very much for listening. God bless you. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The chairman of the occasion, Alhaji Bashir al Hatu, uh, the guest lecturer, is now being invited to deliver his lecture. The vice president of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, and the title of the lecture is Facing the New Decade. It is a thing of celebration to the Federal University community here because they are hosting a caliber of vice president in a series of university convocation lecture for the first time. That is why you may need to know that for the large number of attendees, the university authority has to move the venue of the, of the lecture from a hall to this convocation arena. This is the first time this kind of lecture is holding at the arena. I want to first 
start by saying that when I was coming in, one of the lawyers in the university warned me and said, this afternoon or this evening, there are going to be two lawyers be before you, the vice president himself and also Alhaji Bashir al -Hatu. And he warned me that I should be very careful about what I I'm going to say. Professor Mohammed Bella Umar, director in the entrepreneurship department of the university, are introducing the convocation lecturer, the vice president of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbaju. I will be serving as an orator in probably somewhere like Kirikiri, but I'm trying to be very careful. In fact, one of the key things I want to say is that it is remarkably difficult for someone to introduce a person or an individual that is known by everybody. In the last four weeks, when I learned that Oshim Banjo was going to come here, I had to do a lot of research. I had to do a lot of investigation. And I came across a new name that is coming to me for the first time, which is Olukeke. When I approached one of my Yoruba friends to translate to me what Olukeke means, believe me, because he's a modern Yoruba man, he didn't even know the meaning. Well, probably when the vice president will be making his presentation, he's going to give us emojis on that. And looking at the fact that everybody knows him, I came to the conclusion that it is not necessary for me to do a chronological rendition of the life of Osim Banjo. Nonetheless, I want to approach his introduction from the context and perspectives of his lifelong experience. From what I have gone through, especially in terms of his writings, I want to tell you that it's a very fantastic story. His books, his articles that have been published both nationally and internationally are in fact intellectually exemplary. As a scholar and as a professional lawyer, Oshim Banjo had published in over 100 books and journals and legal reviews. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I feel greatly honored and most distinctively privileged to more elaborately introduce Professor Yemi Oshim Banjo, Oshim Bajo, SANGCO and Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And I'm going to walk through this from the perspective of where he was, what he did, and how. I have used the word elaborate, but in reality, when you look at the volumes on Oshim Banjo and the time and occasion I have been given to do my job, I feel the effort can best be described as an elaborately sketchy one. The question is, how can something that is sketchy be elaborate? Perhaps this is more ironic than anything. So in the end, Whatever we are going to hear today, or whatever I'm going to say, is fundamentally microscopic. It's just an insignificant portion of what I'm supposed to say. It is not in any way a full description of this person that is often referred to as a political colossus. It is just an attempt to tell a story. Oshim Banjo, as a community organizer and a spiritual leader in Lagos, no one can dispute that. No one can dispute his competence, considering the position he has climbed in the redeemed Christian church at Lagos Province 48, where he served as a pastor. Still and more than ever before, Yemi Oshimbanjo bestowed, is bestowed with some outstanding gifts, and that includes his powerful intellect and oratory. His intellect has made him appreciate and understand the essence of continuous struggle that is intensely required in order to build a nation and in order to build Nigeria. So as a man of intellect, we find him 
fervently devoted to the common good. A rare thing, but more true among intellectuals. The Vice President's journey from boyhood teaches us about the power of a simple life with purpose. At this point, I must say, each one of us, and especially FUD graduates, should take note. Listening to his speeches, many of us see him as an excellent Nigerian, just as the chairman said, whose understanding of and for Nigeria knows no limit. His thoughts for our country and for the change that we must introduce are limitless. Of course, this is a function of many factors, but most importantly, this is propelled by his unlimited drive to change Nigeria. Change, it is said, does not come rolling in on the wheels of inevitability, but from continued struggle. In studying his life as a law professor and a statesman, and as a career of providential messages, he has demonstrated fantastic awareness of the enigma of our present day Nigeria. You can see that in his writings, in his speeches, presentations, and above all in his conduct. Many believe that we have changed so much as a country and as a people, and many others believe that Nigeria has a long way to go in order to facilitate change, to fulfill the Nigeria idea or the Nigeria project. The VP in his own case understands very clearly the yoke that has kept our country behind. He often has indicated that we must take off the yoke in order to create abundant opportunities for success. One of such is the fervent struggle to educate every child, boy or girl, and very importantly, irrespective of home or social background, implying the inclusion of every Nigerian and equality of access. The Vice President realizes that as Nigerians, we indeed have a right to education, to good life, to freedom of speech, to freedom of association, and to a really functional democracy. He sees Nigeria where all children must go to school, where no one eats from the dustbin, where every talent can be tapped and all dreams have real potentials. We also know that the VP in his various positions and tasks have taken many bold steps to improve our country and to move us forward by firstly viewing education as a constitutional right, viewing poverty as negatively disruptive and as avoidable. By this, he has given many of us hope, given us the opportunity to dream more dreams and to realize that all our dreams have potentials. Mr. Chairman, sir, the VP has lit a fire under us to move Nigeria forward using our ideas and creativity. I am optimistic that he will demonstrate our feelings in the forthcoming conversation. <clears throat> Just like mentioned by the chairman, the social investment programs are examples. We feel that fire. We also share his drive for genuine change. We heard his talks, which truly represent him, and they are indeed a driving force to change and are propelling us towards the idea. Excuse me. <laughs> <clears throat> the Vice President, in his ways, has portrayed an elevation of substance over outward appearance, an emphasis on character over celebrity, lasting achievements over short-term gains. Unlike many other politicians, who can't even find their way through the federal capital territory. <clears throat> he is not someone who is given to chasing titles or outward glamour or getting worried over 2023 polls. I've been warned that time is against us, but <clears throat> all these things have been achieved 
by the vice president for three factors, for three reasons. Number one, he was bestowed with good education and training. Number two, he had good experience and also spoke well, which also spoke well for a statesman. Number three, he has a very fine hajia behind him. Because they said behind every successful man, there is a woman. As one final statement and declaration, Mr. Vice President, I want to declare that we are joining in committing to you and our host that we'll continue to build this university as an egalitarian center for advanced teaching and learning and research. We also commit to you and our country that no FUD student will be left behind because of his family income. It is an honor to have you with us this evening, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Yemi Oshimajo. The orator of the Federal University, Duse, Professor Mohammed Bello Umar, gave uh, a brief uh, introduction of the guest lecturer, Professor Yemi Oshimbaju, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Like I, I, like, like I earlier told you, this occasion is graced by important personalities, uh, including His Eminence, the Sultan Mohammed Saad Abubakar, His Royal Highness, the Emir of Sokoto, uh, the Emir of Kanu, I beg your pardon, and also the Emir of Dusi, the host Emir is also here while the host governor, Mohammed Badr Abubakar, the vice president. Sir. The Waziri Ndutse Alaji Bashir Mohammed Dahatu, the vice chancellor of the Federal University Dutse, Professor Fatima Batu Mukhtar, and her husband, <laughs> who is, by the way, in charge, <laughs> His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, Alaji Muhammad Saad Abubakar III, His Royal Highness, the M.A. of Kano, Malam Muhammadu Sanusi II, His Royal Highness, the M.A. of Dutse, Dr. Nuhu Muhammad Sanusi, other royal fathers here present, the former governor of Kano State, Professor Hafiz Abubakar, the Executive Secretary, National Universities Commission, Professor Abubakar Adamu Rashid, the Executive Secretary, Universal Basic Education Commission, Dr. Hamid Boboi, the entire management and staff of the Federal University, Dutse, graduating students, distinguished guests, Great Nigerian students, greatest of the greatest of the greatest of the greatest Nigerian students, great students of the Federal University Dutse, greatest of the greatest of the greatest of the greatest of the greatest. <laughs> Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am greatly indebted to the council and management of this great center of learning and research for the opportunity to give this lecture as part of the fifth convocation ceremonies of the university. My special gratitude to Professor Fatima Batu Mukhtar, the dynamic vice chancellor of this university. Not only not only for the invitation, uh, but also for the warm hospitality accorded to me and my entourage since our arrival here today. Every citadel of learning derives its claims to greatness from the reputation and accomplishments of its students and staff, the great academics and scholars to whom has been given the enormous task 
of instructing, of guiding, and inspiring the minds and talents that are destined to define the future. Your task as academics and scholars is possibly the noblest that anyone could ask for, yet it is often without reward or even gratitude. But we thank you today for your great and priceless service to this and to coming generations. It is most pleasing to learn that the proverbial seed that was planted less than a decade ago, the Federal University Dutze, has not only produced already four sets of graduates, and tomorrow, by the grace of God, a fifth set, but also has grown so bounteously to have now over 7,000 students spread across six faculties, including a College of Medicine and Health Sciences. Yours is the first among the set of universities set up by the federal government in 2011 to establish a College of Medicine and Health Sciences. Congratulations. Equally remarkable are the reports of the great exploits being recorded by the university in many fields that amply validate the promise of the fruitful synergy of town and gown. Let me cite just two examples. In recognition of your relevant and innovative research efforts, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture selected your university to host the Agribusiness Incubation Centers. The second has been your response to the security challenges besetting our nation today. You elected to express a shared commitment to the national search for the solution by being the first amongst your peers to mount a program on criminology and security studies, thereby demonstrating your relevance and proving that the university should not only be an incubator of ideas, but also a solution provider. Congratulations on these sterling achievements. And to the students of the university, and especially the graduating class of 2019, let me just say congratulations and well done. The future is certainly very bright indeed. Madam Vice Chancellor, my lecture titled Facing the New Decade, a topic which you graciously allowed me to choose, is really directed at the young men and women who are in this arena today. I count myself as one of those young men and women. And I hope that those of us who are here also see ourselves as young men and women. But the reasons why I think this is addressed to the young people here is first, that the young men and women, students of this university, are the future of our country. Secondly, that future has already arrived at our doorsteps, perhaps much faster than we expected. So for the next few minutes, you'll permit me to take you on a brief journey into this imminent future, how it will affect us all, and my humble suggestions about what we may need to do to make the best of it. Let me begin by making a few general statements and perhaps some predictions. First is that the next few decades will present tremendous opportunities for getting well-paying jobs and lucrative entrepreneurship opportunities all over the world. Anyone will be able to access many of those jobs and those opportunities without even having to move from your own country. In some cases, without even leaving your home. There will be a true international marketplace of ideas, talents, and opportunities. But to access that marketplace, you need to become, in many senses, a global citizen. And a lot of that will be by your own effort. Self-education, self-education, self-development will be important. The second is technology. In its various iterations and applications will be crucial in all and every aspect of human existence. The greater our access to technology, our adaptation and application of it, 
to our to the ideas that we have, the more successful we are likely to be. The third is that we are today. The third is that we are today in the most advanced moment in human history. And on a daily basis, knowledge and its application grows in leaps and bounds. For the first time in human history, any one of us can be heard or seen all over the world by live streaming without owning our own satellite TV station. We can share ideas with millions of people in seconds on Facebook or on Instagram. It was Arthur Clarke, the British science fiction writer, who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is not different anymore from magic. If you follow some of the trends today in technology over the past years in particular, much of that statement is true. As the coming years look set to be one of the most spectacular magic shows ever. Last year, DeepMind, which is a learning outfit, announced that one of its healthcare algorithms could detect over 50 eye diseases as accurately as a trained doctor. Only recently, we witnessed the trial run of an artificial intelligence news reader on the Chinese Xinhua news station and the unveiling of a digital assistant that can mimic the voice of human beings with uncanny likeness. It is called the Google Duplex. There are provinces in China that are now trying out artificial intelligence teachers in remote villages where graduates and young people are not likely to stay. In 2018, there was a world first, in the, the first in the history of mankind, an artificial intelligence system engaged in a two-way debate with a human opponent. The fourth and perhaps the most important point that I wish to make to you is that the abundance of natural resources such as we have in Nigeria, oil and several minerals, even talent, mean little if nothing or nothing unless we are able to creatively and by using innovation and adding value add to whatever it is that we have in terms of talent or resources. Let me put it differently. The difference between poverty and wealth or mediocrity and high achievement is creativity or the capacity and willingness to add value. This is the reason why the manufacturers of Apple, the Apple iPad or the Apple iPhone, make more money in four months than Nigeria earns from oil in one year. Apple sells the product of the ingenuity of the human mind, ideas translated to products, services, and solutions that millions of people are prepared to pay for. And because the capacity of the human mind for creativity and generation of ideas and for innovation and invention is limitless, the source of wealth of innovation companies and individuals is also limitless. On the other hand, oil drilling and selling and other extractive activities without adding value by refining and developing a whole petrochemical ecosystem cannot yield optimal profit or create the jobs and wealth. Similarly, the mere fact that you have large tracts of arable land for agriculture does not mean that you will succeed in agriculture or become wealthy or even as a nation be able to feed ourselves. Anybody can plant a seed and expect a harvest. But the reason why most farmers are subsistence farmers and why they remain relatively poor is because they add no value to what they produce by processing or packaging or making other products out of the raw harvest. And also because many times they do not have access to the cutting edge innovations and inventions in farm inputs and farming techniques. Those who can add value to the farmer's harvest 
become wealthier than the farmer. So the growers of the raw materials are the weakest in the value chain and the poorest. For example, the man who makes chocolates from cocoa is bound to be richer than the cocoa farmer. He has added value to the raw cocoa by processing. In some cases, by designing and packing the chocolates in appealing wrappers. By adding value, you'll create more jobs and more wealth. So while we will always need the traditional professionals, we will always need doctors, lawyers, accountants, and bankers, but those adding value to their services will make more money than they can. So those developing artificial intelligence for giving legal advice or medical diagnosis or accounting or banking will be more successful than the professionals themselves. So the future of banking and financial services doesn't even necessarily belong to the banks or bankers as we know them today. It may well belong to the fintechs, the financial technology companies, and other technology-enabled solutions. So for example, today we have Kia Kia, the name of a company that uses artificial intelligence and algorithms to process loan requests in minutes and can grant credit without the hassles of regular banks. Or Kuda Bank, another Nigerian example set up by very young people, is a bank without a, f a single physical branch. It's called itself a bank, it's a payment system with all its features built into a mobile application. There's also Eyowo, another example of a payment services company which is designed for identifying, for enumerating and paying to and collecting repayments from the over 2.2 million trader money and market money beneficiaries. They have completely revolutionized financial inclusion making and receiving payments from the farthest parts of Nigeria. There's also another company called Paystack, also set up by young Nigerians, many of them under the age of 30. And they have developed applications that makes it easier to make payments across the world. There's also Invest Bamboo, another Nigerian company, started by two 26-year-old Nigerians. They offer new ways for you to save money and to invest in stocks just from a single application. Others have developed technologies that make it possible for us to invest in farms without even ever seeing the farm. Two Nigerian companies, again, set up by young Nigerians under the age of 35, Thrive are Greek and Farm Crowding. These are great examples of service providers that help small-scale farmers to scale up and to access valuable training. All of this done through crowdfunding. In the world of medicine and healthcare, there is Life Bank, owned by a young Nigerian lady. This is a health technology startup, which uses drones today, drone technology, to facilitate the delivery of blood to various health centers. Or we could take another called 54Gene. This is a firm that is harnessing genomic data from African DNA to revolutionize the drug industry, changing the future of medicine. Even in the usually conservative legal profession to which I and the chairman belong, entrepreneurs are disrupting the old trends. There is a digital legal research company called Law Pavilion. The company's digital tools help to do legal, uh, to do legal research quickly and efficiently. They even answer legal questions. So it's possible by putting a legal question to this artificial intelligence setup to get some answers to your questions. Judges and lawyers subscribe to it and they use it. It's a very lucrative value addition to legal practice. Yet the founder and CEO of the company is not even a lawyer. So today there are opportunities for entrepreneurs to build their businesses around traditional professions without being professionals themselves. The most widely read online publications are neither owned nor run by trained journalists. Some of us are familiar with the uh, this news aggregation platform called Naira Land. It was started by two young men who were students of the Obafemi Awolowo University 
while they were still in school. Today is one of the most successful uh, social media platforms that we have. Even in many of the most, even many of the most successful advertising companies or PR companies, many of those who founded them have no training in these disciplines. Most are self-taught. My nephew, who is a lawyer, is establishing an organic farm and a poultry after taking lessons online. His only, exp his only knowledge was derived from taking a few classes by somebody from Kano State who was offering training for people who wanted to go into poultry online. But let me also direct our minds, especially the minds of those of, the, of, those of us who are here, the young men and women who are here, to the new opportunities that are being created every day. Data science is one big area. Currently, whenever you use the internet, you leave vast amounts of your personal data online. And in the near future, companies will need data scientists to go through all of these information and to generate answers to business questions and to make recommendations based on their findings. Many businesses already spend a lot of time and money going through people's data so that they can sell them products. This is a new area of opportunities for jobs. Another big area is content production, 3D and 2D animation, virtual effects and special effects, as well as augmented reality and virtual reality. The use of animation in education, in entertainment and media is growing in leaps and bounds. Those who can create content with animation are being and will be much sought after, especially in the years to come. According to a recent survey by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, multimedia artists and animators are amongst the highest paid within the US uh, workforce. This has translated to more jobs for animators in emerging economies such as India, Vietnam, and now Nigeria. The average pay of a 3D animator in Nigeria, who has just started an entry level, is between 300,000 and 500,000 monthly, Naira. Now, what has happened also is that in our training of empire beneficiaries, we set aside a fair amount of money to train animators. And we've carried out two trainings, two sets of training, one in the north and one in the south of Nigeria. In total, we have trained over 25,000 young men and women in animation. Also remember that content is becoming more in demand with the streaming wars that are taking place now, with Netflix, with Disney, and only recently, Airtel, the, our, our phone provider, has launched its own streaming service in Nigeria. Then we have the whole range of cybersecurity, another big area of opportunity. Today, there are new opportunities for cybersecurity specialists. How is that? With each technological advance comes the addition of more security risks just to store the inf information and to keep the information secure. Therefore, cybersecurity will continue to be a growing sector. In this sense, each country will have its own specific regulations, just as we have, and many other international re regulations, which will ensure that professionals with an advanced technological background, capable of nullifying new threats that are posed to both technology and people, will be in demand all the time. How about 3D printing? 3D printing is also becoming an area of great, ent of, of great need and it will become even more relevant and fundamental in the future, especially when you compare it with artificial intelligence and robotics. Experts in 3D printing must possess creative skills with ability to improve profitability and the applicability of models. And also, they must have some computer skills and a knowledge of 3D printing tools. The federal government recently again established, about two years ago now, we established a humanitarian hub in Adamawa State. In that hub, young Nigerians are trained to use 3D printers to make artificial limbs. And today, they've been making several artificial limbs 
for people who have lost their limbs, especially those who lost their limbs in the conflicts in, in, in the Northeast. And this is a growth area. And I'm sure that it will continue to grow because 3D printing can be applied in so many different ways and for so many different purposes. Experts are required in 3D printing. And it doesn't take a year to even learn to use 3D printers. Madam Vice Chancellor, the technical revolution from the last few decades has considerably changed the business and cultural world. Currently, we live in an application economy as a result of the amount of technology and mobility that surrounds us with all of our smartphone applications that we depend on for everything, from mobile banking to even health monitoring these days. As such, it's difficult to find a reason why one should not try to find something that is related to technology to do, especially when we consider that it's already present in practically everything we do, from our professions, in our companies, to our personal lives as consumers. This means that computer programming, in one shape or form or the other, will continue to be an important skill for those who are seeking to gain viable employment, the kind of employment that will provide opportunities and a decent pay. So today, the most successful businesses are those that are able to add value. Even our culture can become a great wealth creator, but only if we add value. So just doing traditional dances is not enough. To, to put together eight or 16 young men and women dancing before guests when they come, foreign or local guests, cannot make money. Organizing dance dramas, on the other hand, can make money. When, when a whole outfit is created, when a whole drama outfit is created with our culture and our songs, where we're able to employ script writers, a composer, an arranger, a director, then it is possible to begin to make money even from our cultural dances. But the most important thing is that we must add value. In our future, there is truly something for everyone. We should take all advantage of digital technology, especially social media and the various platforms on offer to grow a customer base, to gain traction and advance businesses. Anybody can write a blog. Anybody can develop a website to sell products or even your ideas. Whatever it is you know how to do. People are running full-fledged commercial businesses on Instagram without a single physical shop an opportunity that's only made possible by the internet. We are an entrepreneurial people, a society of multitaskers, who now, thanks to the virtual economy, can make real opportunity out of anything that we are passionate about. So the question for many of our young people today is, what is your passion? How can you take the skills that you have and add value to the world around you? Our future, the future, is going to depend a great deal on what we do with our passions and how we can sell what it is that we are passionate about to millions of people of all over the world. I've seen videos on tutorials on how to make good soup, just making good soup alone, or baking the best cakes. And all of these videos get hundreds of thousands of views on Instagram or YouTube, people advertising on them. Recently, I'm sure many of us might have, or some of us might have come across the YouTuber called Dima Ume, and he's using, just showing people how to use makeup, how to master the highlights and the contours. That's all that he's teaching people. And, and, she, and she says that she's already made her first million just from YouTube, just teaching people how to use makeup. I've also seen some YouTube videos or people teaching young women how to keep their husbands. I don't know how many people have seen those videos. What to do to keep your husband. Very interesting videos, I must tell you. I've watched some of them and I'm very careful now because I hope my wife has not been looking at them too, too closely. Thanks to the social media, whatever ideas and skills that you have can be leveraged for benefit. Your knowledge is of immense importance, and you, have find, and you have to find creative ways 
of taking advantage of it. While it is easier than ever to sell your knowledge and skills, it's also becoming easier and cheaper for you to acquire skills. For example, there's something called the mobile prof. This is an application which you can actually get on your smartphone, even sometimes just using USSD. It's an application for teaching people how to code, how to actually write codes, just using your mobile phone. You don't even need a laptop anymore. The future is about self-education. It's about self-development. It's important for every one of us to invest in the incredible opportunities that are already available for online education. Years ago, it was impossible to do a specialized course in a leading international university without first gaining admission, paying a lot of money, and then traveling abroad. Today, you can sit in the comfort of your own home and get a sound education. Universities such as Harvard and Dartmouth College and several others are offering full-time online courses. For example, some of them are offering online courses. Those two are offering online courses on data science, on Linux programming, through a learning platform that is called EDX. This means that you can learn a whole new programming language in a year for less than it would have cost you to even get on a flight to go to America. There are several new means of self-education, and they are more accessible than anyone might have thought only a few years ago. There's no question at all that an exciting future lies ahead of us. There are breakthroughs in radical technologies capable of disrupting whole industries and perhaps even our very conception of work itself. So for higher institutions who are getting graduates ready for the world of work, for the graduates and new graduates, and the new graduates and the near graduates who are here today, what does the disruption of the workforce by emerging technologies signify for livelihoods and employment? Today, there are several important implications related to the fields of artificial intelligence and emerging technologies that will change radically the way we work and will radically change our economies. So we have seen, for example, that much of what is considered analytical work by lawyers, by investment bankers, accountants, and the age-old professions will be performed better by machines in a fraction of the time that human beings can. So legal advice, especially of the routine kind, will be given now by machines and has already been given by artificial intelligence. I've given you one example of a Nigerian and several new applications have been developed every day. So there's a need to train our professionals differently with these new opportunities and challenges in mind. With the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, the so-called internet of things, the world of work, the way we work, is constantly changing and is driven by the inexorable forces that have an impact not only on professional services but on manufacturing and trade, on global supply chains and the digitalization of the global economy, to name just a few. So for example, the supervision work that managers do is changing rapidly and there may soon be no need for it, for supervisors in the workplace. A young lady who owns a clothing store in Abuja and Lagos, but lives in Abuja, was showing me on her laptop how she can remotely see all that is going on in her shop in Lagos, real time, minute by minute, second by second. So she can actually speak to her employees from her laptop, real time, her employees in Lagos, while she's in Abuja, seeing everything that is going on in her shop. That's now readily available technology. In other words, she can supervise her store herself from anywhere in the world. So the type of manager that you will now need going forward will be a different type. Supervisors will become irrelevant. Education today must therefore be education for employability. The sort of education that makes us employable and that makes us relevant in the technologies and in the opportunities that are presenting itself today. So our curricula, the university curricula, curricula of tertiary education must be versatile, it must be dynamic. The focus must be on innovation, 
on critical thinking, on interdisciplinary thinking, on design thinking, on synergizing and collaboration with others across the world to solve problems. The era of cramming the teacher's notes and just reproducing those notes for high grades is over. The graduate of the future is a problem solver. The graduates that we're pushing out today are problem solvers, thinkers, entrepreneurs, our educators and policy makers, schools and universities must adapt their curricula, their policies and projects to improve the skills that enable the graduate to nimbly and constantly respond to the ever-changing face of the economy and the workplace. A student of humanities today, equipped with the, with the best skills or with the right skills and mindset, will be part of the collaboration to build an application that will redefine an aspect of our business. In other words, a student of history, a student of English, a student of languages, without any previous scientific training or knowledge, can, with the right skills that are being taught today, with even just self-teaching, can develop applications that will change the business, that will change business and industry and earn a lot of money. Because applications are, de are, are developed by collaboration. So there are those who are scientists. There are, those, there are those who come from it from a point of view of imagination. There are those who come from a point of view of design. All of them collaborating. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, was more of an artist than a computer scientist. And yet he developed some of the most incredible applications that we've ever seen and made the kind of profit that makes everybody wonder whether they are not in the wrong profession. A man or woman of ideas, no matter your degree, can become in collaboration with others, the designers or owners of the next application that will make billions and create jobs for millions. This is the exciting future that is ahead of us. The opportunities are limitless. I want to urge all of us, especially the young people who are here, to note that we are in the best times in the history of mankind. Let nobody tell you about the good old days. I've said before, and I'm quoting someone, I'm not so sure who it is, who said that those who keep reminding us of the good old days are probably suffering from memory loss. We must not allow them to keep talking about the good old days. We are in the best times possible today. These are the best times that are possible. And the reason why these are the best times is because we are in the most technologically advanced moment in human history. This is the most technologically advanced moment. This is the most advanced moment in the history of mankind. We have never been as advanced as we are today. It was uh, Farid Zakaria, the CNN journalist, who said, and I'm quoting him, that the smartphones, the phones that we have today, have more computing power than all of the computing power that took men to the moon on the spacecraft, that first spacecraft that took men to the moon. All the computing power that was in that spacecraft, we now have 100 times that computing power in the smartphones, the phones that we are carrying around today. So, so we are living in a, in, in a time of sheer magic and we must take advantage and we must take every advantage of it. And I know that the young people here, especially those of this, the Federal University of Dutse, are raring to go. The future is certainly bright. Thank you very much. God bless you. The future is really bright. Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo. One interesting word he has a takeaway is that we are in the best time because this is the most technologically advanced time. The topic of the lecture is facing the new decade. So the Vice President dwelt extensively on the issue of technological advancement, self-development, and also how to use technology 
in advancing ourselves and also the nation, Nigerian nation. The Vice President started by commending the university authority in their research efforts, especially one important thing they did in the university, which is the initiation of a program on criminology and security studies, which he said will help the country in conducting research as we face issues of security challenges in the country. The Vice President spoke on various challenges facing us as a nation. I identified areas to change our way to grow in this new decade. More importantly, as an agriculturalist uh, eco dominated economy, the Vice President stressed the need for changing our way from traditional way to scientific and mechanized way of farming. Other issues he highlighted include uh, use of internet in a positive way, not way of spreading fake news, but to enhance entrepreneurship and other developmental strides. The Vice President has been presented with a plug by the Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Fatima Batulu Mutar. Right now, like I was telling you, the Vice President highlighted this uh, in the lecture how to take good advantage of digital technology for self-development and that of Nigerian nation. One key word is the future is about education and about self-development. Hello, Academic Services, Professor Abdul Karim Sabo Muhammad for the vote of thanks. Step by step, we are coming to the end of this uh, pre-convocation lecture of the Federal University Duse in Jigawa State. And tomorrow is going to be the convocation proper, uh, which is the fifth convocation since the establishment of the university. The Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Professor Sabo has been called to give vote of tax. Guest lecturer, His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, S-A-N-G-C-O-N, for honoring our invitation and for delivering this highly educative, uh, stimulating and memorable lecture. Thank you, Your Excellency. Our appreciation also goes uh, to their excellencies, the governors of Jigawa State and his deputy, uh, representatives of uh, Governor Excellency, uh, Governor of Kano State, for all their support uh, and the entire entourage they come with. To our royal fathers, his eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, their royal highnesses, the emirs of Kano and Dutse, we say a big thank you for gracing and blessing our occasion. We are also thankful to all Director Generals, uh, Executive Secretaries, Commissioners, Commandants, and all other invited dignitaries uh, from both government and private sectors, who are too many to mention, but especially the Executive Secretary of the National University Commission and the Registrar Jam for their support and attendance. Last but not the least, we are highly thankful uh, to the contractors that have donated uh, generously to make this occasion uh, possible. And also to the Convocation Lecture Organizing Committee for a wonderful job of putting this together and the law enforcement agents for maintaining peace and order. Finally, uh, we wish you all safe return to your respective destination. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite the Chief Man of Federal University to say for the closing prayer. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا أجنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا أذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين Shall we rise for the Federal University Anthem before we take the National Anthem 
The Federal University Anthem, please. lecture delivered by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshimbajo. Uh, this is where we come to the end of today's lecture and tomorrow, inshallah, Saturday, uh, the convocation proper would hold here at the same arena uh, where the university will hold its fifth convocation ceremony. On behalf of the entire crew here of the Nigerian Television Authority, I am Abdullahi Garba saying Bye for now.